In this lecture, I will introduce interrupts in the PIC microcontroller architecture. So what are interrupts? Interrupts is, are special events that, as soon as they happen, we want to handle them right away, but they are events that happen perhaps irregularly, and so we don't want to check for them on a particular interval and waste processor resources. So when an interrupt happens, our code execution stops at exactly where it was, it goes to an interrupt service routine which allows us to handle the interruptible event in question and then after the interrupt service routine finishes it restores context and returns back to where the code was running before you can think of an interrupt service routine as a special subroutine that is called not by a statement in code such as call my sub but a special subroutine that is called because a particular event has occurred so an example of an interrupt, suppose we were watching this lecture in an actual lecture hall on campus. What would happen if the fire alarm went off right at this moment? Well, hopefully you wouldn't just stay in front of your computer or in the middle of the class. You would actually want to get outside. So we would stop the lecture wherever we were. Everyone would go outside. And once we got the all clear and somebody had told us the building was safe, we would go back inside and continue the lecture where we left off. And so it's important to note that we would continue where we, would, we left off if possible. We wouldn't restart the lecture at the beginning. We wouldn't just cancel it. We would continue where we were. But in the moment when the fire is still a potential threat to us, we want to handle that right away and take care of it as soon as possible. So the fire alarm can be thought of as an interruptible event. And so whenever a fire alarm goes off, and hopefully wherever you are it goes off infrequently, but when it does, you want to be able to handle it right away. So, within the PIC 16F 1719, there are 23 interrupts available. That means there are 23 different events that could occur that could cause an interrupt within the PIC microcontroller code. Now, that is not to say that you will need to use all 23. In fact, you can use no interrupts, you can use just one interrupt, or any other combination of the interrupts that are available. In the rest of this lecture we will talk about specifically three of the interrupts that are available on this microcontroller and briefly touch on 20 of the some of the 20 other peripheral interrupts that exist. So the main register to be aware of when talking about interrupts is the intcon. This is short for interrupt configuration register. Bit 7 is the most important bit when it comes to interrupts. That is the GIE, or Global Interrupt Enable. Without setting this bit, no interrupts can occur. If this is set, the specific interrupts that are individually enabled by an enable bit can occur. If you want to enable any of the 20 peripheral interrupts, you must also set the PEIE bit, which is the Peripheral Interrupt Enable. The three interrupts that can be enabled from the intcon register are the timer zero overflow interrupt, the external interrupt, and the interrupt on change. The timer zero overflow interrupt occurs when the timer zero module, which is an 8-bit timer, increments from FF to 00, zero causing an overflow of the timer register. When that occurs, the timer zero overflow flag, which is bit two of intcon, is set. You can also have the external or RB0 interrupt enabled, which will act when the signal coming in from RB0 either is a rising edge or a falling edge. More about that later. You can also have edge detection on any of the pins of interest by configuring that through the interrupt on change, but that requires a little bit more configuration than just using the external interrupt, which is a special interrupt connected specifically to RB0. So what happens when an interrupt occurs? The code stops executing right where it is, so the program counter, instead of continuing to go to the next line of code, it is automatically changed to the interrupt service vector, which is line 4, or memory location 4. At the time that the interrupt triggers, the flag associated with that interrupt gets set. All of the other interrupts are disabled, so the GIE bit is temporarily cleared. 
the value of the program counter is put on the stack. So prior to changing to memory location 4 in the program memory, we want to save the context of where we were, just like would occur when we call a subroutine, and that allows us to get back to wherever we were executing our code prior to the interruptible event. Various core registers, W status, the BSR, FSR, and the PCLATH, are saved in shadow registers. This means that they are saved in some temporary registers which allow the context to be restored when we return from the interrupt. And they will automatically be restored once the interrupt service routine completes. And it is important to note that because we automatically branch into memory location 4 in our program memory, at that location it is important to put an org statement at 4 and then put a statement that says go to and the name of the interrupt service routine. So you can actually write the interrupt service routine starting at location 4, but if you want your main to be a little bit higher in code and the interrupt service routine to happen later, you can simply org at location 4 and say go to ISR and then have the ISR somewhere later in your code. So let's talk a little bit about interrupt service routines. What do they do? Well, they handle the response to the interrupt event. And the first thing you need to do is determine which interruptible event happened. So if you've enabled more than one interrupt, you will want to check the flags to determine whether you had something like a timer zero overflow event or you had an external change on one of the pins all of those things would be handled in presumably a different manner. And so it's important, first of all, to know what interrupt occurred. Then, once we know what interrupt occurred, we should have code that will handle that particular interruptible event. And at the end of our interrupt service routine, we will have a special type of return. RETFIE acts just like a regular return, but this is a special return from an interrupt because it also re-enables interrupts by resetting the GIE bit in the intcon register and when this is called those special registers, the core registers, are restored from the shadow registers allowing that context to return. If you want to use any of the peripheral interrupts they have enable bits spread across three registers PIE1 through PIE3 and so those other special interrupts allow us to handle things like serial communication, analog to digital conversion, and some of the other timers such as the timer 1 module. They also allow us to handle things like particular memory writes or if we detect particular problems on the processor. So there are 20 total interrupts that are enabled by the PIE bits. We will talk more about those in context when we learn about other features such as analog to digital conversion and serial communication in this course. The response to those peripheral interrupts is in the PIR register. So PIR1 through PIR3 are where you can go to check the flags to see if any of the peripheral interrupts have been triggered. We will again talk more about those registers when we get into the specific context of those interrupts. So the basic logic for the interrupt is shown here. It's important to note that the GIE bit is the main bit that allows any interrupt to go to the CPU. So you need a 1 out here to have an interrupt go to the CPU, and that is impossible if GIE goes to 0. And again, remember that when you are inside an interrupt service routine handling an interrupt that has already occurred, the GIE bit goes to 0, so you cannot interrupt once again. If you have enabled any of these interrupts that we've already talked about, like the timer zero overflow, the external interrupt, or the interrupt on change, when those interrupt events occur and the flag gets set, you will now have a one on these gates, and that will flow a one through to here, and if the GIE bit is also set, then an interrupt can be issued. It is important to note that the flags get set whenever that event occurs, regardless of whether you've enabled the event. So for example, if your timer module overflows from FF to 00, the TMR0IF flag will still be set, but it will only trigger an interrupt if you have enabled that particular interrupt and set the GIE bit. 
if you want to use these peripheral interrupts you must also have set the PEIE bit and additionally have the particular enable within the PIE register accordingly. So for example, if you want to enable the timer 1 overflow um, interrupt, then you have the TMR1 IE and its corresponding flag would be the TMR1 IF. So let's talk about some of the special interrupts that we can enable within the IntCon register. First, we're going to talk about the external interrupt and you can read more about this in section 7.4 of the datasheet on page 90. This is enabled as mentioned previously by setting the INTE bit and the GIE. Once both of those bits are set when you have an interrupting event on port B bit 0 and that can be either a rising edge or a falling edge which is uh, determined by bit 6 of the option register then when that occurs you will trigger an interrupt and go to the interrupt service routine to handle it. Interrupt on change is a little bit more complicated because not only do we have to simply enable this interrupt and set the GIE bit, we must determine specifically which edge on which pin do we want to cause an interrupt. And so you can read much more about this in section 13 of the datasheet starting on page 157. The interrupt is first of all enabled using the interrupt on change enable bit which is bit 4 of the intcon and it's triggered whenever the signal that you enable has either a rising or a falling edge as configured. So you can configure with some interrupt on change registers whether you want a positive edge or a negative edge. So for example if you want a rising edge on one of the bits in port A to cause an interrupt to occur then there is an IOCAP register which is short for interrupt on change in A for positive edges. You can also use the interrupt on change in A for negative edges or the IOCAN which will allow you to configure an interrupt when there is a negative edge on a particular pin. The flags associated with those particular pin changes are in IOCAF, IOCBF, IOCCF, etc. So here is a summary of the registers associated with the interrupt on change. In order to use these, your pins must be operating in a digital mode, so the and cell registers are used. Intcon, of course, must be used to set the GIE bit and the IOCIE and then you see that we have various flag and negative and positive enables um, for the different ports. So for example here are the three registers for interrupt on change associated with port A. The IOCAF which is where the flags are when that um, change has occurred. The IOCAN allows us to set negative or falling edge triggered interrupts on those pins and IOCAP allows us to set positive or rising edge triggers. And so if you're configuring in bit 7 that will be associated with pin RA7. If you're configuring in bit 6 that will be associated with RA6 etc. And so you can see that you have registers for port A, port B, port C, and port E. Port E is a little bit limited and only based on this one particular pin but you have full access in port A, port B, and port C for an interrupt on change. Also you have the TRIS registers associated here and that is largely because you must make sure if you want an interrupt on change that those pins are configured as inputs. So the next interrupt to talk about is the timer zero interrupt. The timer zero module is an 8-bit timer and when it overflows from FF to 00, zero that can trigger an interrupt. The value in timer 0 is incremented based upon either external events using the timer 0 clock input which is on RA4 or it can be incremented based upon instruction clock cycles. And we have talked about that previously in a whole lecture on the timer module. The interrupt can be enabled when we go from FF to 00, zero and is enabled using intcon bit 5. The flag corresponding to this interrupt is bit 2 of the intcon register, the timer 0 interrupt flag, TMR0IF.
Also, when configuring the timer zero interrupt, you must set or clear several bits in the option register. So the option register allows us to determine what our clock source is and if we want to use a prescaler. And so you can set up with the timer zero CS, which is the clock source, whether or not you are going to be using the internal clock, the instruction clock, or if you are going to use it in a counter mode based on external events on pin RA4. You can also determine if you want to count on rising or falling edges using the timer zero SE which selects the edge and you can determine whether or not you want to use a prescaler which is to say do we want to count every time that there is a clock event or an event on the external pin or do we want to skip and only count every two, every four, all the way up through every 256. And so PSA is a bit used to determine whether there is a prescaler assigned. And then the three least significant bits of the option register are the PS bits, which allow us to choose what our particular prescaler is. So in general, when you're thinking about when would you ever use interrupts? External interrupts, like we have on the interrupt on change or the port B bit zero external interrupt can be used to detect when a user has pushed a button for example. It can be used when you have a sensor such as a gas level indicator which allows us to detect levels of fuel or various other pressures or things like that. You can also use it to detect for security systems if an intruder has crossed maybe an invisible beam sensor or something like that. Timers are used for all sorts of timed processes. So you can think about setting a timer for waking up. You can think about setting a timer for a particular baking operation. Any kind of a timed process, you can set a timer for. You can include that in sporting events and various other things that are timed. Perhaps you have a room with limited access, so you can only have a finite number of seats in a theater and you want to count how many people have entered the room, you can use the external interrupt uh, or the external um, clock in order to count that. And of course we also have various manufacturing operations that require specific times, say times to cure, time to uh, go through conveyors and things like that. So in summary, interrupts allow us to stop code immediately and handle specific events. When they happen, the program counter is shifted to the interrupt service routine, and that is where we handle the event. Once the event is handled, the program counter is restored from the stack and allows us to go back, restoring the context of special function registers. More on interrupts as we get into the context for their use later in the course.